Welcome, everybody. Oh, sorry. I think that's how we met. It's loud. Um, let's start with a clip, shall we? I couldn't afford enough 
Bohemian carpet to get us to the stage. I mean, it was a short walk, but it was pretty luxurious, right? <laughs>
The question on everybody's mind right now is why isn't a professor from media arts doing this introduction? Uh, why is it this guy from the Department of Recording Industry with zero background in comedy, animation, and writing for television? Well, it has to do with age. As I've been telling my students this past week, I've known Mike Scully for as long as most of your parents have been alive. Um, I met Mike while working uh, in a record store, uh, shout out Belmont Records, Springfield Mass, uh, in the uh, late 1970s. Uh, Mike used to come into the store all the time and we bonded over a mutual love of rock and roll, specifically Bruce Springsteen and NRBQ, hockey, and anything related to comedy. We laughed a lot. So, I'll always remember the day that Mike came into the store and to tell me he was going to move to LA and try to make it as a stand-up comedian, which I thought was a fairly risky proposition. Um, but, in typical Mike Scully fashion, he said to me, well, if it doesn't work out, I'll have seen a lot of cool bands and I'll come back with a lot of cool stories. I'm so happy that didn't happen. Um, so, stand-up led to sitcom audience warm-up, joke writing to writing scripts for sitcoms, to being hired in 1993 to write for The Simpsons, to becoming the showrunner from 1997 to 2001. He would go on to write and co-executive produce during season seven and eight of Everybody Loves Raymond, winning an Emmy for his work. He's written and served as a consulting producer on Parks and Recreation and The Carmichael Show, and wrote jokes for three Golden Globe ceremonies hosted by Tina Fey and Amy Poehler. More recently, he was co-creator with his wife Julie Thacker and Amy Poehler on the animated series Duncanville, uh, which just ran for which ran for three seasons on Fox, and where he also served as an inspiration for the show's dad. Uh, and yes, he still occasionally works for The Simpsons. In 2010, Mike received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Writers Guild of America West, and in 2008, was awarded an honorary doctorate from Westfield State University, Go Owls, <laughs> which is widely regarded as the Harvard of the Massachusetts State University system. <laughs> and the alma mater of myself and my lovely wife. Uh, Mike decided he definitely wanted to break into comedy, even though he told an interviewer once, I really had no relief reason to believe I could succeed. Well, he has. All of us are the beneficiaries of Mike's talent and success. Please welcome my old pal, Mike Scully. show of the Fox Network, and it, uh, it was my job to not sink that ship. It had won multiple Emmy Awards, the prestigious Peabody Award, but most important, it was making shitloads of money for Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And that's how Rupert likes his money, by the shitload. <laughs> I looked at the 20 Harvard graduates that made up the Simpsons writer staff, and I was now in charge of them. They were not only brilliant comedy writers, they were brilliant at the things they were going to do before deciding to become comedy writers. Uh, lawyers, mathematicians, biochemists. Uh, one of them had invented a crucial part for artificial hearts at 18 years old. Right, yeah. At 18, I was like struggling to make Kraft mac and cheese. <laughs> um, but anyhow, this was my staff. These Ivy League geniuses were all looking to me for guidance and direction. A guy who only went to community college. Okay, that's a lie. I attended community college for one day. All right, half a day. <laughs> you see, uh, if you quit in the first 48 hours, you get a full refund. <laughs> so, and it was only 150 bucks, but I was paying for it because my dad considered me a risky investment. <laughs> uh, so I got my money back and spent it on something far more important than education. Springsteen tickets. <laughs> the concert was four hours long. Ironically, two hours longer than I had stayed in college. <laughs> now this, uh, in this Harvard writer's room, I was the village idiot and someone had now put the idiot in charge of this multi-billion dollar village. Uh, you know, all I could think was, how did I get here? Uh, now, first of all, this talk is not an endorsement of not going to college. <laughs> I don't want y'all calling your parents tonight going, Mike Scully came today and he said we're wasting our time. <laughs> um, it just happened to work for me, uh, basically. Uh, do I wish I went to college? Absolutely. I, first of all, I would be a lot smarter. Second, I wouldn't have to pretend I understand all the intellectual jokes that are in The Simpsons. Because a lot of times, somebody would say a, a joke and like 19 Harvard grads are laughing. I don't have a fucking clue what they're talking about. But I go with their laughter and I say, let's put that in the script, trying to appear smart. I can look it up when I get home. Uh, it's the, you know, here, hang on a second, sorry. Uh, but I know it sounds weird to say that I didn't go to college, but in the 70s, college and, you know, was not an automatic thing for every kid. In my neighborhood, you know, it was kind of an industrial neighborhood. We were expected to get a job in a factory, stay there 50 years, receive a pension, and then die. <laughs> that was kind of the life plan. And I knew I wanted more than that. And although my teachers told me I was smart, I wasn't a great student in high school. I'm, on my report cards, they frequently wrote things like squandering his potential or wasting time of kids who actually want to learn. Then finally, just throw them in the army and get it over with. <laughs> so let's flash through the eight years after I made the terrible decision to quit college. I worked a series of dead-end jobs, retail, fast food, pumping gas, hospital janitor, driving instructor, and at a real low point, cleaning rooms in a seedy motel where the sign advertised businessman's rates. <laughs> the 70s were a really gross decade. <laughs> John, you're with me on that, right? <laughs> All the way. <laughs> I was on the road to nowhere. And my father kept asking, you know, what are you going to do with your life? And I told him I just wanted to hang out with my friends. I want to go see bands. I want to have fun. So he gave me the nickname Fun Boy. Every night I'd come home late, and he'd be sitting there in his uh, big chair, smoking a cigarette, and said, do you have enough fun tonight, Fun Boy? <laughs> sure you want to go back out and have a little more fun? <laughs> so he didn't know it, but he was actually inspiring. Behind every successful guy of my generation is a father yelling, you're never going to amount to anything. <laughs> and oddly enough, he passed away a few years ago, and when we were having him cremated, I couldn't help but think, no, who's never going to amount to anything? Too dark? 
On my 25th birthday, I was doing what I usually did, sitting in a car with my friends in a Burger King parking lot, listening to 8-tracks. Big 8-track fans here? Ask your grandparents. Keep moving. Uh, but this night was different. I had an epiphany. Now, I hadn't gone to college, so I didn't know the word epiphany. So, let's just say I had a big thought. I'm going to pursue my passion. And the only thing standing in my way was having no idea what my passion was. I knew I liked watching TV. I liked comedy. I liked sitting in the Burger King parking lot with my friends. Uh, what else? Oh, I liked hanging out at a record store with my super cool friend, John Dugan. But who wants to do that the rest of their life? So I told my parents about my, uh, and then I thought, so I, so I tried to come up with what am I going to do with my life, and then it suddenly hit me. What would piss my dad off the most? I was like, I know. I'll go to Hollywood and break into show business. <laughs> So I told my parents my plan that night, and my dad was his usual encouraging self. <laughs> That's the stupidest fucking idea I've ever had. <laughs> you think someone's gonna pay you to write jokes, fun boy? Uh, but my mom, on the other hand, was very supportive. Uh, and without her, I wouldn't be here tonight, because she said, your 20s are your time for pursuing your dreams. And if you don't do it now, you'll always regret having not tried and wonder if you ever really could have made it. So anyhow, someday you will have kids and when they come to you with a plan that sounds really dumb, give them a shot, they might just make it and then you get to take credit for it later. <laughs> Once in LA, I threw myself into pursuing comedy writing. I did stand up at open mic nights. I went to tapings of TV shows like Cheers and Taxi and Family Ties. I attended every TV writing panel I could find. I went to a bookstore in Hollywood that sold used TV scripts for three bucks. I bought a bunch and studied them like textbooks. I started to see the structure of an episode. I could see like how they built in the conflict, how the story, how the jokes served as the story, how the story built to the commercial breaks. Commercials? Anybody? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I realized this was my college. And I never worked harder at anything in my life. See, I told you it'd be a pro college speech, see? <laughs> now can I have my check? <laughs> so anyway, that's the very short version of how I got here, and now we're gonna go to the two old guys sitting in Cher's talking park. So I'm gonna join John over here, and continue, so thank you very much. TV. I was a real TV kid. I mean, um, it was like you know Lucy and the Dick Van Dyke Show and uh, you know, uh, cartoons. I, I like too, but I can't say that they were a passion. Uh, but I did enjoy them. Um, but still, like, and as I got older, like I remember in high school discovering Monty Python's Flying Circus um, on PBS. So it finally gave me a reason to watch PBS. <laughs> Uh, and that had a huge influence on me. Movies like the Marx Brothers and Laurel and Hardy, anything that had like a little bit of a subversive edge to it, uh, or I felt like they were doing something different than what I might see in other places. So those were uh, giant influences on me moving forward. Uh, a comedy team called the Smothers Brothers, I don't know if you know, were very influential uh, on me also. So uh, I 
kind of soaked up as much comedy as I could. My brother watched Star Trek all the time, and I was just always like, Gilligan's Island. <laughs> well, and I, and I think a lot of those shows you're referencing to, and the films you're referencing to, referencing, at the time, you were watching something that was 30 to 40 years old by the time it was reaching you. So oh, yeah. it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't like you were being influenced by something that was like really contemporary. You were watching something that a parent's generation or conceivably a grandparent's generation was watching at some point. So it, it, it's comedy that, to use the cliche, it stood the test of time. I mean, you know, when, when are the Marx Brothers not funny? Right, yeah. And it's, I enjoyed it first just as like the Marx Brothers, for example, a movie called Duck Soup. I just thought it was brilliantly funny, and I'm watching, and I didn't know it was made. It was in black and white, so I knew it was older, but I really didn't know when it was made. It was the 1930s, uh, and <laughs> stuff like that. I just drew comedy from wherever. I didn't care how old it was. It would bug me if I missed it. When I find out that I missed something great that's funny, I don't care when it was made. I want to go back and see what it is, because you can pull from that. And as many times you see in a show, and I've sat in writer's room where writers think we're working on something groundbreaking and innovative, and I know, like, I saw this in a Marx Brothers movie 40 years ago. Because <laughs> uh, you're always rewriting is what you're doing with comedy. So, uh, yeah, to me, I don't care if something is considered kind of ancient history. It stays alive for a reason. It stands the test of time, because it's still funny. So for many of you in the audience today, that would be being influenced by something that happened in maybe the early 1980s, late 1970s, early 1980s. If you're watching maybe a sitcom from that era, or even an 80s sitcom like Cheers or something like yeah. that, that it, it, would, it would still maintain a kind of currency. Um, Mike, talk a little bit about um, doing stand-up and the transition you made from doing stand-up into writing. Because, I mean, obviously the two are linked because you're writing jokes. But you make this leap from doing stand-up and writing jokes to writing scripts. And right. what, what, did, what did you learn in stand-up that helped you as a writer? I, uh, yeah, I think when I first got to LA, you could go around town to various comedy clubs, like the Comedy Store and the Improv, and they would, every, they would have an open mic night, one night a week. So you go in and you sign up and put your name on a piece of paper, they put it in a hat, and over the course of the night they draw it out. And you go up and do your, your five minutes. So I bombed a lot, <laughs> because frequently you're going on at like 1.30 in the morning, there's just a handful of people left, that are, that, you know, they're all wasted, and you're never really getting a sense of, am I any good at this, am I kidding myself? So there was uh, actually one week I went and I begged the MC, I, I said, please, you know, I said, this is, I'm at a crossroads here, I have to make a big decision. But I need to try, you know, I need to perform in front of an actual crowd. Uh, so could you put me on when the place is packed? And he said, yeah, he would put me on at 10 p.m., which was perfect. So it comes to you know, 10 p.m., it's getting near there. He brings up the performer right before me. I recognized the name because I had seen it on the list, so I knew I was next. The MC goes up and starts the intro, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, we have a real treat for you tonight. And I was like, wow, well, all right, he's overselling a little bit, okay. Uh, and he just, so he goes, Robin Williams. <laughs> and Robin was in the club, I didn't know it. <laughs> so Robin goes up on stage and just destroys for 45 minutes, just kills, like, finishes, giant ovation from the crowd. And then uh, he like heads out into the night. The MC comes back on stage and without even taking a beat goes, and now Mike Scully. <laughs> <laughs> and it really was like kind of a fight or flight. I mean, part of me just wanted to run out to the car and just get the hell out. Uh, but I went up and all I could hear was, you know, the sound of wooden chairs on a wooden floor when you're <laughs> scraping across. And, people getting their car keys out of him. <laughs> it was a mess. But I will say, uh, I did get things out. First, I got to see Robin Williams for free. And that was cool. <laughs> there was like somewhere in the middle of his set, I was enjoying it so much, I had forgotten how terrified I should have been. You know? But I did learn a lot doing stand-up. What you write down on a piece of paper as a, a piece of like, comedy material, what looks short on a piece of paper, when you say it to a crowd, 
it's interminable. So it taught me editing. Uh, I learned how to get rid of all the unnecessary words in a joke to the point of unnecessary syllables. If, if I feel there's like three extra syllables in a joke, I'll, I get them out. Even if I, I'll, I'll switch words for a shorter word. Anything that gets you to the joke faster. So I did learn that stuff, and I got to meet some, you know, some, uh, you know, you just met some cool people in the bathroom sometimes. <laughs> um, so for all the cool people. Anyway. Yes, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you do, you know, with every experience you get, even if it's like a devastatingly humiliating experience, you can try to take out some sort of positive lesson from it and apply it to hopefully making the next step forward. Um, you did a great podcast with uh, Ken Levine, uh, and you were talking about your career, and it, 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 it's worth finding. It's what Hollywood and Levine, or yes, yeah, Hollywood yeah. and Levine. If you could listen to the podcast where Ken uh, Levine, who worked on uh, what he did, he work on Cheers, and Cheers, Mash. And Mash. Yeah. Uh, it's a great interview with Mike. But in the interview uh, that when I was listening to, it, one of the things I was struck by was Mike talking about all the steps he took as a writer prior to getting to The Simpsons in 1993. And if you could talk about this for a little bit, I think it would be great. The, the notion that every step along the way might not have been the perfect situation, but you were learning as you went along. You were learning how, you were learning your craft, you were sharpening your writing, you were figuring out things like what worked and didn't work. And even though, it, it, you know, at some point it might have seemed like drudgery at some point or, or whatever, or you wondered if people were actually watching the show. Yeah, it was, um during that time, I was, I was working like a full-time day job, um, engraving, uh, you know those stores with coffee mugs with your name on it? That, that I was working in one of those stores, putting names on people's coffee mugs. And yet you never made one for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I would write at night, but also sometimes people in the business would come in to the store, so I always made sure I had my sample scripts under the counter because I was pretty shameless about, like, I'd put their mugs in the bag and I'd throw a script in with it if I, <laughs> if I, if I recognized their name from the credit card. <laughs> um, but, what was the question again? <laughs> what went on in the bathrooms in the 70s? No, I... <laughs> Uh, no, it's, it, it, you know, when you started, uh, you, you were writing gags for Yakov, Smirnoff writing jokes oh, for right. Yakov, and then you were working on his sitcom, and then you worked on a bunch of sitcoms that led up to The Simpsons. Yeah, I don't know how many of you might be familiar. There was, uh, he's still alive. His name is Yakov Smirnoff. He's a Russian comedian. And I had done a joke one night at an open mic night, and a comic there, it had like a Russian angle to, to the joke. And he came to me, this comic said, I know a guy who would buy that joke. And I didn't even know people did that. I didn't know like, you just sold jokes. <laughs> so um, I said, oh, okay, sure. So he, he hooked us up. Yakov took the joke. And uh, he said, do you have any more Russian jokes? <laughs> so naturally, I lied. Uh, and I said, oh, shit, yeah, tons. <laughs> That's all I do is write Russian jokes. <laughs> um, so uh, that weekend, I just wrote as many jokes as I could think of with my very limited knowledge of Russia. <laughs> Gave it to him the following week, and he took them on the road with him and started calling me up and saying, hey, this joke is working, this joke is working. So it turned into a, a relationship where suddenly I was his primary joke writer. And then he wound up getting his own sitcom eventually uh, called What a Country, Hold Your Applause. Um, <laughs> and he wound up, bring, he trusted that I knew how to write his voice, uh, and so, so he got me on the show as a writer and it wound up being my first sitcom job. So you kind of never know, like it was that one joke that happened to be about Russia being heard by a comic who was a friend of a comic who, who was Russian, you know, you follow this crazy zigzag, and then I wound up getting my first sitcom. I, I don't know how painful this is going to be, but talk a little bit about working on uh, Out of This World. Because I think you have a good Burt Reynolds story here, if I remember correctly. Oh, shit. Uh, uh, Didn't he just, like, show up and 
he was just male. He was only the voice on the oh, show. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't know. It, it, was only, it, was, it was a show called Out of This World. About after what a country was canceled, I wound up at this show, and it was about a girl whose father lived on another planet. <laughs> Stick with me. Um, <laughs> This and, is the elevator bitch. Yeah, and they, and they her, uh, he had married her mother, they had a child, it was her, and she had powers that she inherited from her father. Like the, her big power in the show was she could stop time by putting her fingers together. Very elaborate special effects. <laughs> Basically she would do this and everybody in the scene would just stand still. <laughs> but anyway, the voice of the father Show. He, she only talked to him through this device that looked like a candy dish, um, was the movie star Burt Reynolds, who was a giant movie star. <laughs> At one time, the biggest movie star in the country. Uh, he was going through an ugly divorce at the time, <laughs> he needed some money, and he took the job on the show, providing we didn't put his name in the credits. <laughs> so he would pull up to the back, like a limo would show up at the back, he'd run into the recording studio and just bang out like eight episodes, <laughs> like, like that, and just be doing like, okay, love you, honey, love you, honey. Love you. Whatever he had to say that week, and that's why you should be yourself, love you, honey. <laughs> uh, and that was it. But, uh, was that? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I actually, I actually uh, watched a couple of episodes of Out of This World. And, uh, yeah, it's Out of This World. Uh, uh, there was one, uh, we, um, after I left Parks and Rec, there was one day, they had been kind of goofing around, I guess, on the internet, and somehow wound up looking up that show, not knowing I was a part of it. And I got a text from Mike Scher, the creator of Parks and Rec, and it showed my credit. On, out of this world, with, and with just a bunch of question marks. <laughs> and um, just to put a pin in Out of This World, you worked with your brother Brian on that show. Yeah, my brother Brian, who went on to work at Simpsons, uh, The Drew Carey Show, and 10 years at Family Guy uh, as a writer. So yeah, I met him there and, uh, and my wife. But uh, you know, once again, I learned a lot. It, 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 very quickly, that show, the first year of it, you know, I was kind of the low person on the writing staff with the least amount of experience, but I was very eager and hungry. The person in charge, but who was not actually running a show, there was, they were kind of not getting along, the guy running the show and the guy in charge of him. And he came to the writing staff one day and said, listen, tomorrow morning, when you all come in, I'm not gonna be here. And I was oh, all right. We thought he had like a doctor's appointment. <laughs> I'm never coming back. <laughs> just, now you gotta keep this secret, don't say anything, but I just want you to know I've enjoyed working with all of you. And, and he left. Uh, the next day, true to his word, he didn't show up. They asked us, do you know where John is? And we're like, uh, no, no. <laughs> well, they turned around and made me the showrunner, and it was only my second year in show business. <laughs> because they knew I was very eager. Uh, they, what they did was they gave me the title but kept me at my staff writer salary, my junior writer salary. But suddenly I was in charge of things and had responsibilities. <laughs> so I decided, yes, I could probably put up a big stick and say you should you know, be paying me this. And, uh, and I decided if, if I do that, well, then they're going to go out and get somebody of more experience who knows how to do this job. So I decided to take it and and decided to make it a learning experience. Uh, so I kind of learned on the fly how to run a show, you know, how, how everything worked in a TV show. Got paid a fraction of what I should have been getting, but you know, in hindsight, you know, it was it wound up being a real smart decision. So always, I think, when you find yourself out there in the workforce. Think of, you know, those situations will pop up. They will always try to squeeze a little you know, extra out of you for as little money as possible. But instead of thinking about how pissed you are at, the, at how they're handling it, think about what's possibly could be in it for you. What's the upside for you? Uh, always think what's the upside before what's the downside. And you usually will come out with something good that you can look back on later and laugh about. That, um, that comment about squeezing a little more out of you, that, that never happens in academia. Yeah. <laughs>
it's just we don't even know what that means. Um, so, uh, 1993, uh, David Merkin, right, hires you at The Simpsons. Right. Uh, and your first day at The Simpsons is Conan O'Brien's last day. Yes. Um, I got there. Uh, Conan, I had heard, like, legend of Conan. Uh, like, around writer's room, you, you would hear this guy's name, Conan O'Brien. <laughs> And he became very famous for like uh, standing, and he's already like six foot six or something. He would stand on the table in the writers' room and pitch stuff like that, and and march up and down, giving these big speeches, and and he would do it all, all in character voices. Uh, and I thought, oh wow, I'm finally going to get to work with this guy I've heard so much about. Uh, and I get there, and we're introduced to each other, we shake hands, somebody taps him on the shoulder and says, you have a phone call. So he left, and he didn't come back. And it turned out he had done an audition show for NBC for his first late night show. They, it, was, it was Conan versus, I believe, Jon Stewart, yeah. who shot the other one. Yeah. And they decided to go with Conan, who was completely unknown. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so he, he never did come back <laughs> Like, he was told, stay in your apartment, don't come out, you know, until we introduce you to America. So, he was afraid to even call the show, like, we didn't know, like, did he get an attitude to something horrible? But, anyhow, so I never wound up working with Conan, but when I started on the show, I had made the mistake, two weeks before I was supposed to start working on The Simpsons, Vanity Fair had an article uh, the Simpsons, the dream team of TV comedy, and uh, and I got in my own head, I and mean, I've been comfortable in rooms on other shows uh, pitching, but for some reason when I read that article, I freaked out, and so for the first, and I'm not exaggerating, <laughs> the first three months, I don't say a word in the room, I mean like nothing. And even when like we were trying to think of a joke for some spot in the script, I would have a joke in my head and I that I would pitch on any other show, but on the Simpsons, no, no, that's it's not good enough for this show. It's a stupid joke. And I would get mad at myself. Then somebody else would pitch the identical joke, giant laugh. <laughs> uh, and it goes in, and the one move you can never make in a writer's room is go, Oh, I had that too. Uh, you know, you just look like you're my answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, but every night I went home, you know, I'd be like driving home, and I would tell my wife, like, we cannot buy anything. We're not buying a house, we're not buying a car. I am so gonna get fired from this thing. And then, because so much time goes by, that by the time I read it, then I started to think, when I finally do pitch something, it's gonna be the first time any of them have heard my voice, <laughs> and they're all gonna look around, like, and so you know, like, oh fuck, now I know it's gotta be really that much better. So if you find yourself in a situation, a collaborative situation, where establish your voice kind of early in the room, even just in conversation. So, um, you know, when you do talk, it doesn't shock people. <laughs> but yeah, I spent the whole first year on The Simpsons absolutely positive I was gonna be fine. And yet, four years later, you're the showrunner. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. How did that happen? Um, the, they had a lot of turnover on the staff in the early years of the show, and the two show, showrunners prior to me it was a team named Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein, and they did a lot of great episodes. Um, they didn't like to be in the writers' room a lot. They preferred working off on their own, or they were editing and things like that. So they assigned me to run one room, and a guy named David Cohen, who created Futurama, ran the other room. So we were kind of learning the job on our own. So originally David and I were going to run it together when Bill and Josh left. Uh, we were going to run it together, but then David uh, created Futurama with Matt. And so David left and somehow they just handed it to me. <laughs> I didn't ask any questions. <laughs> well, and um, something you and I have talked about is um, the fact that when you start, during your time as showrunner from 97 to 2001, this is the emergence of the internet. And the yes. internet is is forever altering how people are viewing television shows and how people interact with television shows as opposed to when we were young, you had to call the station or actually write a letter. Now people are have uh, direct access to that. How That must have been really difficult in the early days. 
Oh yeah, it started a little before I took over, but it was happening, there were these news groups, uh, and they all started with like alt.tv, that was like alt TV Simpsons, and suddenly there was a critique coming of every episode the next day, and that's where the, the, catch, the comic book guy's catchphrase, worst episode ever, <laughs> came from that group. Uh, they used to write it all the time. Uh, so we took it from them and started using it in the show. But it did, uh, you know, the internet has had a huge effect on TV. I try my hardest to not look at it in regards to things I'm working on, but sometimes you can't help it. Um, but there's a part of me that's, uh, the old man of me is like, gee, how did we make great television before the internet, <laughs> you know? Oh, this guy's got the fix right here. <laughs> he could have he figured it out. But, uh, so, but it definitely has an influence, and now the, uh, the, the streamers and the networks will look at the, the amount of interaction on the internet, the amount of time a show is referred to, just to see what the conversation is, how many people are watching it and engaged enough to actually talk about it online. The part I don't get, I guess, is the doing it while you're watching the show, which is what a lot of people yeah. do. They're typing it, like, well, and maybe it's just me, like, like, how do you, you're commenting on one thing, I'm doing a computer, I'm, you're commenting on, but then you're missing maybe the next three things in the show because you're looking at this screen. So sadly, sometimes I feel like, you know, our jobs have turned into getting people, and I'm not just saying young people, I think it's across the board America. Our job is to get people to look up from their phones three times during our show <laughs> uh, to feel like they might have missed something. Uh, but it, it's it's here to stay for sure. And um, But I try not to be influenced by it. But I, cause I know some people who've looked and have actually like changed storylines yeah. and stuff. And I feel like then you start to kind of lose confidence in yourself. Uh, and I think you always have to bet on yourself. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it, it's gonna be hard because receiving criticism is one thing. Receiving voluminous criticism by what seems to be a growing audience of people has to be just so disheartening. And you're like, do I really want to continue to do this? How, you know, you know how much harder can this get at this point? Where everyone seems to think that they know better than you. Yeah. You know, everyone's a better writer than you, everyone's a better producer than you, whatever. Yeah, no, there was a part there one time that I forget, they were angry at me about something, and somebody had posted, kill Mike Scully and his family. <laughs> <laughs> and it was getting likes, you know? <laughs> I know, it, 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 it's it, hard to believe. And, and this is in the early nice days of the internet. <laughs> It's, it's hard to believe that the internet brings out the worst in people. Um, talk a little bit about making the transition from animation to live action and the problems you had to face making that jump because people, other producers or networks, had typed you in a particular way. All right, yeah, I had been on The Simpsons for quite a while at this point and I got a call um, from a guy named Phil Rosenthal who created the show Everybody Loves Raymond. Uh, and now you'll see him on Netflix and somebody feed Phil if anybody watches that. <laughs> but anyhow, he called me up. I was a big fan of the show just as, as, as a viewer. Um, and he asked, he goes, we have an opening at your level. Would you be interested in joining? And I said, yeah, that sounds fun. I'd love to do that. And he went to the network uh, to put my name in for the job and the network rejected my name. Uh, and he said, why? And, and they called, they said, oh, he's Cartoon Boy. So I had gone from Fun Boy to Cartoon Boy. <laughs> but, and they, so he called me back. He said, are you sh absolutely sure you want this job? And he told me what happened. I said, well, yeah, now I really want this job. So he went back and fought for me and got me in. But I didn't realize up to that point that you could be stereotyped as a writer, too. I knew it was a, it happened to actors, but I didn't know it happened to writers. And only write one thing. So another, you know, lesson learned. Uh, and the same thing with Parks and Rec. I, I never worked on a single camera show before, and never done shows with story arcs that, where the stories last all over over the whole course of the season, as opposed to resetting at the end of every episode. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, kind of, Amy Poehler has a thing she says, like, at, you know, tell people, do what scares you. Uh, and that's why in the last few years she's been directing movies and taking things, you know, doing stuff she's never done before. She directed a documentary, and, uh, and her feeling was, I've seen a lot of people, she says, I, I've worked for a lot of people with far less talent that have done this job. I think I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Mike, since you've been in the business a long time, talk about how the writers' rooms have changed over time. Oh yeah, um, it, it's definitely evolved. There was a time where, like, the writers' room was kind of a sacrosanct, you know, place where anything goes, joke-wise. You know, nothing was off limits, and 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 the reason being was that freedom to throw out any type of a joke or, or even an idea that even out of maybe the most shocking or offensive thing, a great idea might come out of that. And, and I've seen it happen many times. Uh, so, but times have changed, you know, and uh, sometimes for, for the better, uh, in, in many ways for the better, but there's sometimes where you're searching for that, where's that idea we've never heard before? Where's the, the shocking attitude um, from a character that would also play funny? And people get a little hesitant about pitching jokes, which I always feel like, are we missing something great? And then other times it opens up interesting conversations. On the Carmichael show, we had great conversations um, about race and you know, different experiences. Uh, the people like, because you know, after all, you know, I am the voice of young Black America. Uh, <laughs> no, but I, like Gerard is unbelievably smart, and uh, I, I learned a lot from him, but also from the the writing staff he had put together. I was kind of brought in to be, you know, the older guy, and they thought for David Allen Greer, there was nobody like David's age on the staff, and they thought I could, you know, kind of specialize in David. But it was a good learning curve and, uh, on that for me. Uh, on the other hand, there was, uh, on the show we recently did, Duncanville, there was a joke uh, pitch where Duncan, he's a 15-year-old boy, and he just calls his mom a psycho. He's like, stop being such a psycho. And all of a sudden, like somebody in the room said, do we have to say psycho? And I honestly didn't get it. I said, what's the issue? And, as, and I didn't know this, apparently in the 1930s, psycho was a term used to clinically diagnose mental illness, and it was all this whole backstory of the word psycho. And, you know, I'll be honest, I mean, I got a little thrown because I wanted to give respect to where the concern was coming from because I really liked the writer. At the same time, I know 15-year-old boys, and they say stuff like that. So it's that, you know, What's the balance? And I think we're still working it out. Uh, and that's probably going to be for the next few years until people get comfortable with it. And uh, when you were, I, I don't know, we were talking about this last night, but I, I don't know if it was at The Simpsons, but you were trying to get more women into the writing room, yeah. and yet they, the, they were sending you, talent agencies or whatever, were just sending you more men. They weren't sending you any women. Yeah, sometimes something can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, and you know, agents can be a little lazy sometimes, and I noticed when I was running the show, every script that came in was written by a guy. And, I said, and so I was calling agents, asking because I knew I wanted to add uh, women to the staff, and they said, well, we just assume you guys don't hire women. And I said, even if that's true, you should never stop sending it. I said, most of the time, we don't notice the name on the script. Or send scripts without names on them. I prefer not knowing. I like to just read the material. Um, and uh, so it, it just kind of became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Fortunately, that's gotten much better now. But it's always a work in progress. And you know, it, it can certainly always be better than how it's being done. But it's getting so much better now. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I look back like 20, you know, five years ago at a staff, a picture of the Simpsons writing staff, and I see 20 white guys, and I'm, I don't, I don't even have it hanging in my house. Like, how could we be so blind, you know? Um, but, you know, I think 
you, you can't defend it, you can only fix it. So that's, you know, what, and not just our show, but lots of shows are now doing much better with that. Um, just a couple more things, and then we'll open it up to the, uh, the audience here with any questions. But um, what's interesting about you, you is, is that this has become kind of like a family affair. You've got, you know, your brother Brian, who you worked with uh, for a long time, your wife Julie, you co produce stuff, and now your daughter Sarah is getting involved. Right, yeah. Uh, Sarah is, um, I have five kids. Sarah, they're all funny. Sarah kind of takes it to another level and just really makes me laugh. And she started putting, I said, if you want to see, you know, start putting jokes on Twitter, see if people respond. And uh, so she started doing it every day. And, uh, and, and she actually started to get a, a small following on there. And then she started, I started bringing her along. If I was doing a free punch up on a show or a friend's pilot, I would bring Sarah in with me. I said, be ready. I said, I said I'm going to point to you and you better have a joke to finish. Uh, so she'd be sitting there. <laughs> uh, so it was a little trial by fire, but, uh, and then we wound up working with her on Duncanville, she, where she was like kind of the junior writer on the staff. And it was fun. As a dad, it was a kick. Uh, it's weird. Like our other kids, uh, no interest in show business at all. I, I don't know if I made it look very unappealing when they were younger. <laughs> well, and, and you, you had that um, great story about how your kids were just discovering Parks and Rec now, but they weren't watching it while you were actually working on it. Yes, yeah, yeah. They told me they were watching this show on uh, Netflix. They, they called it a Netflix show. This Netflix show called Parks and Rec. Amy Poehler is so funny. And I'm like, are they fucking with me? You know, it's like, it's like I worked on that show. I said, don't you remember every day when I would leave to go to work? Like, where did you think I was going? Like, I don't know. We just didn't really think. We know you work on shows. You know? So yeah, and then they actually wound up seeing me. Into they had started binging it, and then later on they wound up seeing me in some episodes. And suddenly, I had respect for my kids. <laughs> okay, last question, Mike. Um, you, Amy Poehler, Dana Gould, Stephen Wright, all from Massachusetts. Why are people from Massachusetts so damn funny? <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's a weird phenomenon. Like, like, Almost any comedy TV writing staff, you will find at least one person from Massachusetts. I don't know why, but I, I think I think it's maybe a combination of we're always well, we're always angry at something, <laughs> but are looking for a way to express it that they could also find the absurdity. And it, instead of just saying this sucks. Right. We're trying to think of a funny way to say how angry we are about this thing. <laughs> so, but it is a weird and common. Is, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, from Ryan. Ryan. He's yeah, from uh, yeah. he's from Massachusetts yeah, as well. Yeah. We had a great line this morning where we were driving in about I was uh, ripping on Tennessee drivers uh, <laughs> being not very good drivers, and yeah. you said they're driving recklessly to get to the jobs they hate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's open it up to uh, questions from the floor. Anybody have questions? We've got one in the back right there. I've got, it, these lights are blinding me. I feel like I'm in an interrogation session. Uh, my name is Sterling. Uh, and I was going to ask you, I have two questions, actually. Number one, what are some things going on in the industry that you think are about to change or things that are coming or are new uh, into the industry? And also, my other question is, how does The Simpsons predict the future? <laughs> All right. I'll do the second question first. To get a job on the show, and this can't leave this room, you have to be psychic. Um, it's all tested under strict laboratory conditions. <laughs> no, that's that's a crazy thing how that happened. Um, it's it, it's the the real answer is it's pure luck, um, but. You know, we've predicted weird stuff like um, that America would win a gold medal at the uh, curling championships or something. <laughs> we pick weird things. Probably the most famous one is uh, Donald Trump becoming president. And that was, we did that show like 1999. Um, 
it was an episode about the future of fantasy of Lisa and Bart in the future, and Lisa becomes president of the United States. So we had a joke about where she walks into the Oval Office and it's, okay, we've inherited a horrible financial crisis from President Blank. And then we were throwing names out, and God, I wish I could remember some of the other ones. Um, do it. And then finally it was just, you know, somebody had said like, who would be the stupidest person America could have liked? <laughs> well, I, I can't remember who in the room said it, but Donald Trump. <laughs> and it was a giant laugh. It didn't come out of nowhere because around that time, he had flirted with the idea of someday running for president in the future. So it was kind of in the ether a little bit. Uh, but that was like our biggest one, and uh, oh, uh, also, yeah, we needed a joke once for a sign outside. There was an episode where there was a scene of the outside of Fox, and there's a sign outside that Fox broadcast, you know, twi or 20th Century Fox. And then underneath it, we needed like a little uh, joke uh, to go under it. And at that time, uh, the Disney company was kind of buying up a lot of things. They bought the California Angels baseball team and some other things. So we said 20th Century Fox, Fox, a division of the Walt Disney Corporation. <laughs> Not knowing that 20 plus years later that would actually happen and they bought Fox and now we all work for Disney. <laughs> and th those are like lucky guesses and stuff. I mean that one is so random, uh, it, it's weird that it happened. Now it's kind of generated, that there's now people trying to create uh, fakes from the Simpsons, fake predictions, where they're putting together scenes and photoshopping things, that those are, you know, bullshit, but there's been quite a few that, that we've hit for one reason or another. And your, your question was, uh, what's coming in the, in the business? Yeah, what do you think um, is changing in the industry, like, in the next couple? Uh, it's a great question. Um, what we're noticing that's happening right now is people are getting a little overwhelmed with the amount of streaming services. And everyone, like, we, you know, we cut the cord because we were tired of paying the $200 a month cable bill. And now they keep at, you've got, you know, Netflix came along, now you've got Disney Plus and Amazon and Hulu and Peacock. And they're all, you know, suddenly you're paying all these bills per month, and they're going to start raising their prices. Netflix is going up to like $15.99, I believe, and they're going to have a lower price tier with commercials, like old school network TV. So we've kind of come full circle around where we're going to be watching TV with commercials, and by buying all the streaming services, if that's what you do, we're going to be paying the $200 a month we used to give the cable company. It's kind of like when Amazon put all the bookstores out of business. What did they do? They opened up their own Amazon bookstores. And now it's going to be happening in TV. So I'm curious to see what's the tolerance people have for how many streamers will they own? Will they get rid of some as they get more expensive? That kind of thing. So I think that would be something to watch for. Thank you. Sure. Took one right up here. Oh, and one way over here, too. Hello, I'm Bradley Harrison, longtime Simpsons admirer, first time <laughs> watcher a few years ago. And I'm interested in writing for a comedy. For Wait a minute. Longtime admirer, but you just started watching? Is that what you said? Yeah, more like watching clips of Simpsons. Oh, I so know. you've never seen the whole show? Actually, I <laughs> thanks to Disney Plus, I have enjoyed the classics era. But anyways, I'm interested in writing for comedy for things such as TV, movies, games, graphic novels and such. And, and uh, the question that comes to my mind often is, how would you incorporate telling a joke when writing a story? Like, how would you balance adding a joke? Oh, I'm telling a story. Like, how do we come up with the jokes? Or how do we decide what's the right joke for the right spot? Or I'm thinking, like, 
guessing when a joke, what kind of joke it should be, and when do you tell it in the midst of the story, like during an episode? Yeah, it, it shouldn't like stop the story dead. Like to do a joke that that makes it hard to get the story flowing again. It should continue. It should come out kind of organically and be fun, and then you keep moving and And it should feel like it comes out of that character. Uh, a common mistake when people first start writing scripts, and I did this all the time, I couldn't bring myself to cut a joke that I liked. So instead, I'd give the joke to a different character. Even though the, kid, the joke didn't fit that character's uh, attitude, who they were. So, but like, you know, certain jokes, there's conversational jokes, and then there's just jokes that, but my favorite all-time Simpsons joke was written by a guy named John Swartzwelder, where Homer, it's in the episode where they have Prohibition in Springfield, and at the end of the show, Homer, they have beer back in town again, and Homer toasts the town, and he says, to alcohol, the cause of, and solution to, all of life's problems. <laughs> And it's like kind of the quintessential Homer Simpson joke. Like you couldn't do it with Marge or the kids, or it's it's a Homer joke all the way. So when you find that kind of gold, uh, you know, you just grab onto it. Right, we have another question. Thank you so much. much. Sure. We got a lot of people in the middle. A lot of people over here. Let's try to get as many in as we can. Um, hello, I'm Natalie. Uh, I'm wondering what was your favorite like. What are some of like, your favorite jokes to write in The Simpsons? Favorite jokes to write? Um, let's see. There's one in that um, rock and roll fantasy camp show. Um, the setup for that show is Homer was coming home drunk from Lowe's in a cab. And he starts talking about his life and all his regrets and how, you know, when you get married and have kids, your dreams, you know, <laughs> kiss your dreams goodbye and stuff like that. He forgets that he was on the show the next night he's watching TV and they see the show and they, Marge and the kids see him saying these horrible things about them. And then Homer, the joke I love that is when Homer tries to explain to them, he's like, you don't understand. What I'm saying is, Marriage is like a coffin. <laughs> and each kid is another nail. <laughs> but as coffins go... <laughs> so that, that's, that, that's one of my families. But I mean, there's so many uh, over, the, over the years, yeah. <laughs> Everybody yell out a question of <laughs> Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Scully. Thank you so much for coming to introduce sure. you. And so my question is, as you're talking to a group of future media professionals, what would you recommend us to start doing to prep for our careers and to have a good careers? I don't know if that's too hard to think. Uh, no, it's not. It's in prep for your, well, it's different now than certainly than when I started. You have outlets now. Like, when I started, you, you had to move to like New York or LA pretty much, because that's where the, the business was happening. But now, uh, people are being discovered you know, on YouTube and TikTok, uh, Instagram, Twitter. Um, there was one writer who was hired, I think he's on Seth Meyers' show. They had been, somebody on the show was following him on Twitter, and they, they were putting their staff together and they said, this guy always has funny jokes. So they assumed he was an aspiring comedy writer. They tracked him down, found him, and it turned out he owned a small advertising agency in Ohio was, uh, and had no show business aspirations at all. He goes, no, he goes, I come home, I like to unwind by writing funny things. And they're like, well, would you like to move to New York and become a comedy writer? And he wound up getting the job. Um, a lot of writers have been discovered on Twitter for their joke writing ability. Uh, like for a show like that, it's all jokes. Uh, even on sitcoms though, they've taken chances with certain writers who are funny, hoping that they can learn the other parts. It's like you can learn story, you can learn structure, you can learn character. You can't learn funny. Uh, so, uh, but those are all great outlets and ways to be spotted now that didn't exist 
before. I guess the downside of that is there's more people competing. Uh, but I would say if you're not ready to like make the move out, uh, that's a, a great thing to go to. And now, there's also too now a lot of like Zoom panels you can attend, I believe, um, with where people in the business will come in and talk and, and uh, give it because everyone's got like a slightly different story of how they broke in. So if you know for sure, do you know for sure what it is you want to do, or is it kind of a, not having quite settled in on one thing yet? Well, I have two pathways that I'm interested in. The writing pathway, story making pathway, and also technical animation and art pathway. So it's kind of tough balancing the two, but I'm trying my best. Wow, you have already put way more thought than I did at my <laughs> So I think you're going to be fine. But uh, no, those are great. Um, you know, if there's... Yeah, you know, uh, there's so much great animation. I was impressed with what you guys have going on today. There was a time it, there was one school mainly called Cal Arts, uh, where a lot of the animators were coming from. Now, all over the country, there's great animation programs happening. So, if you know like animation in particular is what you want to do, uh, do that, and then you may find you you do it for a certain amount of time, and you want to try something else. There's a great director named Brad Bird who worked on The Simpsons, and he did the movie Ratatouille, and then one day he decided, uh, he did Iron Giant, he, he decided, I want to do a live action movie, and he wound up directing a Mission Impossible, the movie. <laughs> and just, you know, based on his success in animation, because animation had taught him how to storyboard action sequences. So he applied his animation. Did you do The Incredibles too? Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, I did The Incredibles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very quickly, Brad used to work on the show <laughs> when I was there, and he would come to all of our screenings and he would give notes uh, on the screen. He was kind of a quiet guy, but then when we would, we were going back through the show, kind of shot by shot, Brad would, ju he would jump out of his chair and he'd come at the TV screen like a movie camera, like you're watching a movie, and he would be like, no, the camera should come in like this and that. And do all this stuff. We're like, Brad, we got this, sit down. <laughs> Oh, we know our songs. <laughs> we know our songs. <laughs> we know our songs. Yeah. Um, how about a couple more questions, and then Mike's got some um, Fox sense of notes that you want to read. Yeah, whatever you guys uh, want to answer questions. Yeah, uh, whatever yeah. you prefer. He's got some Fox sense of notes, which I'm sure are juicy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Allie's here for that. <laughs> Hi, Mike. Right here. Uh, right here. Right here. Oh, Mike. Oh, Mike. yeah, there you go. Hi. Sorry. Hi Mike, I'm Mike, uh, too. Uh, I only have two questions for you. One, uh, do you have a favorite stand-up who inspires your writing, or just one who makes you laugh really hard? And two, do you have a favorite Simpsons character? Wow, that's an excellent question. A favorite stand-up? Uh, right now, man, there's one. I mean, to be honest, the big influence on me grew up, Woody Allen, sorry. Uh, his stand-up from the 1960s was brilliant. Uh, I mean, I do love uh, Chris Rock. Uh, I, I love everything about him. I love his delivery. I love his wind-up. I, I love the confidence that he has on stage. Because uh, when he paces and he, he's doing his wind-up, I just get excited, like, I can't wait see where he's going with it. So Chris is definitely up there. Uh, still love Seinfeld, admire how hard he still works at it after all these years. Um, so, God, those are some, there's some lesser known people like you know, Chelsea Peretti, so Sarah Silverman, love. Uh, she, yeah, she's so damn funny. Uh, I sometimes go down to like, there's small clubs in LA where you can go and see them kind of working on new material, which is fun. Like Patton Oswalt is another one uh, who's fun to watch. So I mean, there's so many talented ones out there now. We were talking last night about one of the uh, underrated comics who's no longer here, Mitch Hedberg. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, Mitch Hedberg was just brilliant. If you ever get to go on YouTube, look up Mitch Hedberg, H-E-D-B-E-R-G, just brilliant, brilliant. Right, Life. great, you want to eat a thousand or something. Yes, yeah. <laughs> life, life cut too short, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I also wanted to thank you for being here. This has been uh, an amazing opportunity just to listen. Oh, it's my pleasure. 
my question is, uh, what do you think about the evolution of comedy over the years? From, you know, you growing up with, like you said, like I Love Lucy, the Marx Brothers, to, you know, going into the 90s with stuff like The Simpsons, you know, Friends, sitcoms like that, to, you know, modern humor now where it's like, you know, our generation, you can show us like a picture of a crock filled with beans and everybody's just going to like, <laughs> see, see, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Everybody's just going to laugh. I, say, I, I thought you were going to go more towards uh, something like Rick and Morty or something like that. Well, yeah, that's too. I like Rick and Morty. Uh, yeah, in terms of like what's on now, you mean? Yeah, like, uh, what, uh, what do you think about like the evolution and like why comedy changes throughout the years? Uh, I feel like it has to. I think comedy's always been something that has to constantly move forward. If you watch uh, HBO, there's a documentary about George Carlin, uh, and it's it's a long watch. It's about four hours long, but it's so interesting to see what his comedy was in the beginning, and Richard Pryor is in some of it too, and you see them doing kind of what they had to do at the time to make a living. They were on these summer variety shows, family-oriented. They had to be as family-oriented as they could be, but they also knew, like, this isn't what they wanted to do, and they kept pushing. I think Carlin and Pryor are still, like, the two best of all time, probably, uh, because they were constantly pushing forward, you know? I saw Richard Pryor one night at the Comedy Store, um, maybe about a year or so before he passed away, and he came out and he was, he started out funny and then he bombed. And it was hard to watch Richard Pryor bomb because he was a hero, but he was still trying new material, which I like greatly admired because he could have just coasted on the hits, you know? And, you know, same with Carlin, but they just kept pushing, you know, to try to find a new angle on something. So, and I think the same thing in TV. You're just always looking for what's fresh and new. And sometimes it involves going back to something that maybe got missed the first time around, or you're taking what somebody did and twisting it in a different way. Because um, people want to laugh. I, I mean, I've sat in meetings where people who are an executive go, I think people just don't want to laugh anymore. Like, what? <laughs> like, and they'll say like blanket statements like that. A friend of mine pitched a show to Fox about a talking dog, and the person who pitched him said, People don't like dogs anymore. <laughs> That's the dumbest fucking statement. In the world. <laughs> yeah, who else? I saw some friends doing it, I got outside the store, 
hand on my shoulder, store detective, take me back in. But my biggest fear was my mom finding out. You know, like, I didn't care if my dad found out because he'd be yelling at me about something anyway. So, <laughs> but I, if my mom knew, I knew she'd be devastated. So she never found out about it. But when I was at the Simpsons, I thought, all right, bargain caught shoplifting is a great area for a story, uh, but it needed to go somewhere else beyond him being worried about his mom finding out. So I changed it to where his mom really did find out. And it becomes a very emotional story because it changes the dynamic of their relationship. Um, and so that's where you gotta be able to decide how much of the real story do I stick with and how much of it do I make up to entertain America. <laughs> so sometimes you can get too locked into, but that's not how it happened. It's okay to fabricate. <laughs> so, um, and I just wrote one recently too, that another one, my childhood, uh, about uh, my brother and I and my mom and a layer in the fall. And we took liberties with it, but a lot of times you, you find the emotion, but like I said, that, that shoplifting one, it was, even though it didn't play out, that emotional hook I knew was a good one, of Bart's fear of Marge finding out, because we established at the beginning of the show that she still tucks him in at night and sings a little song when she's doing it and he's complaining about it, you know, I'm too old for this, uh, and then when she finds out he got caught shoplifting, there's a, a devastating scene where she, she does the song with Lisa and then she walks to Bart's room and instead of going in, she just clicks the light off and says, good night, and keeps walking. Uh, and yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, one of the things about The Simpsons, from a viewer's perspective, someone who doesn't watch on the show, obviously, is that what I love about it is that it can be very sweet, it can be very moving, but it's not manipulative. You know, it's not like, I remember you telling me once, here's something you'll never hear next week on a very special The Simpsons, right. you know, <laughs> like, like somebody's going to die or something like that, you're not, you're not going to hear that. And there was, a, there was one episode where... I think it was one where Lisa's projecting into the future and then they're at a carnival or something. And the last scene of the episode is Lisa and Homer walking together and they're, she's kind of talking about what she experienced. And uh, it's a very sweet moment because she's talking about something very emotional and Homer goes, I ate a whole pound of fudge. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, that's great, Dad. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it, it's funny and it's sweet, but it's not, it's not Sacrity, it's not manipulative. So uh, yeah, I think The Simpsons has been great at doing that for ever. Yeah, we try not to force the emotion. I mean, it's always great when you can have it, but we try not to force it if the story doesn't lend itself. Sometimes the story is just a comedy story. It's just fun and silly, and those are fun. But I think the richer ones are when we find those you know, little heart moments uh, that, that people relate to. The one with. Um, Lisa's substitute teacher, I think oh, Dustin God. Hoffman did the yes. voice, yeah. and he leaves her a note as he goes away, and she opens up the note thinking it's going to be some something, and it just all the note reads is, you are Lisa Simpson. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, yeah. that's a fantastically, kind of nakedly emotional moment that's not overly saccharine, but it, it strikes a chord. It's beautifully done. Um, and as for the second question about what to do with the shoplifting, I how do you pick yourself up when you when a show ends? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you mean outside of excessive drinking? Yes. <laughs> yeah, angrily tweet. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's tough. I mean, this last show we did, uh, Duncanville, we did three seasons, and we were just having such a blast. The cast was so much fun. To have Amy and Ty Burrell and Rashida Jones and, you know, Wiz Khalifa, who was super funny. Uh, like, who knew? Yeah, <laughs> he was hysterically funny. And he would show up to our Zoom table reads. We never knew if he was gonna show up for sure. And with the Zoom would be kinda, and he knew it started at 10 a.m. Suddenly like 10 a.m., his box flicks on, and Wiz is sitting there, shirtless with a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> And we all looked forward to it. You know, like, it was like, yes, you know, he made it, you know, doing comedy over Zoom is not easy. He made it more fun and entertaining, and he fucking nailed every joke. So I uh, loved working with him. So for that show to come to an end 
where the network was very happy creatively, but they weren't happy with the financial split they had with the two other studios. That's what did the show in. And that was really angering because there's nothing I could do about that. It's, you know, I can't figure that out. You guys thought this was a good deal a couple years ago. Now you don't like it anymore. And so that part was really hard. Yeah, I got, I was angry for a while and I was like, fuck this business. I don't know. <laughs> like that. And then you start kind of like thinking of, of new ideas. And, uh, you know, I, I, matter of fact, just last week, I had lunch with the, the network president who actually made the call to cancel the show. The guy said I would never talk to the rest of my life. I had lunch with him. <laughs> so, because there's only so many places in town to do business, you know? So, uh, but, you know, it hurts. And all writers go through it. I mean, there's been, I'm sure there's been shows you've loved that have, like, gone away far quicker than you wanted them to. And it just sucks. Uh, but, you know. A friend of mine has a saying, uh, uh, George Myers, uh, except some bread, and he, when anything like that happens, he says, and he always says it very upbeat, on to the next indignity. <laughs> 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 it serves me, it serves you well a lot in life. <laughs> I'm definitely holding on to that, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I've just been like, like a butt punch. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> Good. Hi Mike, my name. Hi Mike, my name is Molly Hughes. I have a very technical question about The Simpsons. Uh, how much has The Simpsons changed from a, like animation, production, uh, distribution, and commercial standpoint since you've been on the show? Uh, yeah, it's changed a lot. Like if you look at the season, you know, the first three season show, it's very primitive. Uh, Matt's you know initial character design. I don't know if you've seen the shorts that were part of the Tracy Ullman show. They're like little five, ten second shorts. The, scare, the characters are kind of scary looking. Yeah. You know, they're very pointy yeah. and, uh, yeah. And then an animator named David Silverman, who's a great director, kind of evolved them into what people know now. Uh, but it's definitely evolved a lot. The first 14 seasons were done with hand-drawn cells. Uh, now, from season 15 forward, it's been all digital. I mean, the digital is a cleaner look, it's easier to do the retakes, stuff like that. There's a part of us, uh, for the first years of the show, we miss those kind of jagged, not perfect lines on the characters that we think make it a little more warm and human. Uh, but from a production standpoint, it made more sense to go the other way. And apparently the, the hand-painting cells is now, I guess, a dying art. It was passed down in generations, and now it's not popular anymore because everyone's doing it on computers. So we had to make the change. But it's definitely evolved a lot. So I remember in season nine thinking, wow, we've, our animation is perfect now. You know, we've nailed it because we were comparing it to season one. Now I see a show from back then, and they were terrible. <laughs> you know, and I can still see the mistakes and stuff. But sometimes the mistakes are part of the charm. Hey, my name is Jeff. Uh, I wanted to know what's some of your favorite shows, animations, movies that you like watching now, modern time per se, and some of your favorite like directors also for during this current time as well. Well, um, so my, like contemporary. It can be anything from the animation. I know, like you guys got competition with like Family Guy stuff like that, like stuff, other stuff you like that. Yeah, you know, that I mean, animation-wise, I mean, Pixar, I, I think, are geniuses. Um, I saw a movie last year. Uh, it was not a Pixar movie called Mitchells versus the Machines. Yeah, I thought it was awesome. It was so much fun and it had a ton of heart to it. Uh, a just really, really well-made animated movie. Um, so that's that's probably like the I'm trying to think of other animated movies. There was parts of the last Minions movie. It, it was like a spotty movie, but there were parts that made me laugh out loud. And then there was other parts where I couldn't tell if I was laughing at the movie or laughing at how hard my grandson was laughing. <laughs> so sometimes that colors your view <laughs> watching something when you see a kid enjoying it so much. Um, but yeah, Mitchell's vs. Machines, I thought, was the best animated movie of all, like, the last year or two. 
See, it doesn't have to be animated. It means like live action. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, shit, what have been the big movies? Oh, I really liked All Quiet on the Western Front recently. Um, uh, I enjoyed everything everywhere all at once. Oh, it was a, that was a trip. <laughs> uh, I'm not big like on the Marvel stuff. I, uh, you know, even though that movie you know, takes you on a wild ride, for some reason I think I was with it because of the emotion of the movie. So I was willing to go wherever they went. <laughs> This better be the greatest question ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Ivy Jacobs. I'm an animation major here. Uh, I work on a lot of projects in my free time. And my question for you was, in your occupation, whether it's writing or just anything in general, how do you deal with jealousy in workplace? When you put jealousy, when you put so much passion into something to see other people doing better, in the workplace, yeah. In the workplace, in what way? Like, let's say you pitch a joke and you think, oh, this is the best joke ever, and then someone with less experience pitches a joke and then you're like, so proud of that one, you don't get much attention. Oh, oh, that's interesting. I mean, I, I, it would be too easy to say that doesn't happen, because it definitely happens. Uh, the, um, where you, you, you'll be like, sometimes somebody will be pitching something and it's not getting traction and someone else does pretty much the same thing. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, whoa, yeah, the same thing. What the hell, I was saying the same thing. Um, this is like advice to, to writers. I, I tell writers, if you know, like if you're in a collaborative environment, if your tendency is to be a little on the quiet side or a little withdrawn, don't put yourself at the far end of the table or the back of the room where whoever needs to hear what you're saying might not get to hear it. Um, there's always going to be somebody who's like louder. It's like that. They can do it from anywhere in the room. But so there's that, you know. I'm trying to think of like, just like jealousy wise. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's more on. The, the showrunner has to learn to hear, and it is a skill, like over time, you have to learn to hear everybody in the room who may sometimes be talking simultaneously, and at the same time, you're also thinking your own thoughts, like I'm trying to come up with a joke, I'm trying to hear everyone else, uh, like that. So if you think, if you think maybe someone didn't hear, what you said, you can always try again. Like doing shows on Zoom the last three years, there was a lot of that because people genuinely didn't know if they were being heard because of the audio problems on Zoom. So like you pitch something that in your head was really funny, and then you just look at ten squares of people just staring at you, <laughs> and then like, did they hate it or did they not hear it? You know. <laughs> so you know. Um, but if you're working in a room, is that the, the main issue? Is that you say not being heard or someone else getting, just soaking up more of the oxygen in the room? I guess kind of, not necessarily not being heard, but like, I guess an issue comparing yourself to other people's work. Oh, uh, uh, I just assume I'm the greatest. <laughs> 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 I mean, that works. <laughs> no. Uh, no, well that's what happened, like I said, my first month at The Simpsons, I was so in my head, uh, to me, uh, you know, these are all geniuses, you know, what the hell am I doing in here? And I got, I, you know, I just freaked myself out to the point of where I wouldn't pitch. Uh, and I realized I was damaging myself that if I continue not talking, I'm guaranteed to get fired. So I'd rather start pitching and at least get fired for that, you know, for them not liking what I'm pitching, uh, but yeah, that's that's a whole different situation because 
there was people in there on the Simpsons like, holy shit, I can't, like, I, I use his name a lot, a guy named George Myers, but he would pitch a joke and I would sit there and think, I could never ever come up with that joke. Give me till the end of time and I would not figure out how to do it. And But you realize over time, you have your own strengths. You know, that you bring that maybe a George Meyer will go, shit, I wish I would thought of that, <laughs> you know? George doesn't particularly care for the emotional stuff. So sometimes you, you could, you know, get that. But everybody usually brings something a little bit different into the room. And so focus on what you do well, but also learn from what you're hearing from other people and see how you can adapt it into your own work. If you admire it, uh, Open your mind up a little more. The Simpsons literally changed the way I thought about comedy and, and writing. Where the other shows I had worked on prior, there was kind of a formula to everything, and you just stayed within that formula. The Simpsons was the first show was, for me as a writer. There was no formula to it. It was anything goes, let's throw it out there. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, so what? We'll come up with something else. And I, I found that very freeing, and it opened my mind up a lot uh, to, in, in a way that I hadn't been before. So to tr maybe if there's a way to turn it into a positive, um, don't admire silently. Uh, admire and steal. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. Um, so uh, was this fun, fun book? Yes, it was fun. <laughs> oh, should I give you quick censor notes? Yeah, you will too. Yeah, give yeah. some censor notes. Uh, All right. That's why Allie came. Hang on one second, one second. All right, I'm going to have to go through these kind of quick. Okay, these are censor notes from Fox. Uh, Please do not have Reverend Lovejoy refer to the Bible as a 2,000-year-old sleeping pill. <laughs> Real. Please delete Bart's line, bastard, 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 bastard. <laughs> this repetitious stream of bastards goes too far. <laughs> uh, this is in a Halloween show. Please be sure the dolphin does not look uncomfortable when Mo jams the gas nozzle into its blowhole and explodes it. <laughs> That's, uh, That's a new sense. Yes, uh, and these are in their words. This is how we receive them. Uh, we should clearly be able to tell that it is Milhouse's nose sticking out of his pants zipper, or it could be problematic. <laughs> uh, Barney line, I've got a nozzle in my butt, is problematic. This should be changed to, I've got a nozzle near my butt. <laughs> yeah, they sometimes pitch alternate jokes. And, uh, you took out the funny word, but okay. Um, let's see. Oh, this is one. We had a Viagra-type product in the show that we called Bonestra. And they sent it back, said, this is unacceptable for broadcast. Please come up with another name. So as a joke, we sent over the name Jamadin. <laughs> and they approved it. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks everybody for coming, Mike. Thanks so much. It was great to have you here. Oh, it was good my to see pleasure. You. And thank you. Don't make a mistake. I did stay in school. <laughs> and appreciate your teachers. John Dugan will be retiring soon. He's a legend.